so much for coming. Um, my name is Deborah Oswald. I stumbled into the PCAD universe because I happened to write a novel about a living kidney donation. And uh, since then, I feel like a bit of a lucky duck because you know, I've had the chance to meet this extraordinary group of people who are tackling the problem from all sorts of different directions. I, I was lucky enough too to visit um, Jacqueline Phillips' lab upstairs here um, and wandered around gasping and asking stupid questions as non-scientists tend to do. Um, I came away convinced that Jackie and her team are wizards, um, but benign wizards who deserve funding. Um, <laughs> PKD, uh, the PKD Foundation is, is, is committed to funding, to, find, to research to find a cure, but it's also committed to um, creating a network of patients and medical practitioners to, to be a supportive community, to exchange information and to raise awareness. Our first speaker is Professor Jeremy Chapman. He's a renowned renal physician with a special interest in transplantation. He's a clinical director of the Division of Medicine and Cancer at Westmead Hospital, director of Western Regional Services, and is clinical professor at the University of Sydney. He's written over 350 publications, which is a lot. He must be very tired. And received numerous awards, including the Companion of the Order of Australia. Thank you, Professor Chapman. Um, yeah, so I'm a kidney specialist at uh, Westmead, and um, I have the delightful task of introducing you to some of the, the science uh, and more interesting I hope some of the stories um, behind the science this is polycystic kidney disease that's our most common um, genetic disease in adults um, it's uh, this form is a dominant uh, form which I'll explain in a bit affects one in every 2,500 Australians, so that's pretty common. And what starts with, this is an MRI, and these white things are water-filled cysts. Um, and what starts is a few grows and grows, so you've got very big kidneys, and they don't work anymore. Um, and so they start looking like this. Now there's two sorts, there's three sorts several sorts um, of polycystic kidney disease. I'm going to talk mostly about PKD1 and PKD2. There's also autosomal recessive polycystic kidney disease, which is in kids, um, and that's got a different inheritance. And there's also other diseases like tuberous sclerosis that cause cysts that give us a slightly different picture in the kidney. And then when you get old, you can get cysts too, but they don't cause any um, so we've got PKD1 and PKD2, and I want to tell you a little bit about the story uh, of those developing. Um, there it is. That's the kidney, and it's massive, and that doesn't work properly anymore. And where it starts is the, the tube that produces urine looks like this. You get blood coming into this little filter here. <coughs> Then the blood goes on out here, and through the filter goes the water and some of the proteins and the salts. And they come down this tube and then up back around here. And eventually, after they've been modified by the kidney, so the kidney retrieves all the things it wants from the urine, including a lot of water, um, it goes out here. So about 20 litres goes through these things, and about 2 litres comes out. So these kidneys are pretty good at pulling back um, the substances that you need, including water, and washing away the stuff you don't want, the, the toxins which are created by the metabolism of our body. Um, you eat the cheese, the protein gets digested, it gets into the bloodstream, and then we have to get rid of urea. It's a waste product. If that urea builds up, <coughs> you get sleepier and confused and unwell, and eventually uh, you can die. So we need these things to work really well. And with polycystic kidney disease, what you get very early on with autosomal dominant is you get these little cysts forming. And they grow. So you get a whoops, sorry. You get a cell. You work out which depressing right? you get a cell which goes wrong and it produces this little out patching, dividing away. And then that cuts off and becomes a cyst. And those cysts start to grow. <coughs> and about, you know, whoops, 50% of them 
um, grow so large that they start working and mm -hmm. you end up with dialysis and transplantation, which I'm really not going to talk very much about. And about half of them sort of don't progress. Now, PKD1 tends to progress and PKD2 doesn't. Um, get it right eventually. Genetics. This is the, um, the simple maths of genetics. An autosomal dominant disease means that it's on the normal chromosomes, it's not on the X or the Y chromosome. They're separate. But it's on one of the other chromosomes, and to begin with, we didn't know which. But we knew that if one of a couple had it, the chances of their children having it was 50-50. You either got the gene, or you didn't get the gene. You got the good gene or the bad gene. And you only need one gene to make this disease. With autosomal recessive, you need two genes. So you've got to have one from mum and one from dad to get autosomal recessive um, disease. So those two children, you then can predict exactly what's going to happen next. So this child, when they marry and have kids, there's a 50-50 chance that those kids will have the disease. And this person does not have the disease and cannot pass it on. And so you can see the family is spread like this. So now I need to tell you a little story. So we kind of knew all of this. And we had families when I was working in Oxford as a trainee. And um, when you do medicine and you become a a registrar, and then you become a senior registrar, and then you have to go and do research, because you're supposed to do research, or because it's interesting, or because you can't find a job, and it's something to do until you find a job. So as you get to the end of your clinical training, you've got to go do some research. Well, I went and chose to do transplantation research, and one of my colleagues, on the same little rotation as three of us, um, uh, one of them went off to do nephrology, um, he's actually come back and he's now the Dean of Medicine at the University of New South Wales. Um, and the other guy, he went to work in a lab of a haematologist, a chap called David Wetherill. David Wetherill was the first person who really started getting into genetics. And so what uh, Steve Readers did was he said, well, I want to research the genetics of polycystic kidney disease. And... Um, can I come and work in your lab? He says to um, David Weatherall, he says, yeah, sure. Um, and use the techniques to try and nail where the gene was in polycystic kidney disease, because we haven't got a clue. And so what he did, first of all, is you have to have lots of people. So if you imagine you've got that family, and you pick up, you've got one, two, three, four, five people with the disease, and you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine people without the disease. So you get the genes from all of those, and then you've got to find a pattern which goes positive with the five and negative with the nine. And then that gets you to whatever that marker is that's kind of segregating with polycystic kidney disease. Of course, five and nine doesn't do it. You've got to have big numbers. So he went off to the um, Oxford Renal Unit where we were all working and started talking to all the polycystic kidney patients who had polycystic kidney disease, and he started getting all the family trees and getting a bit of blood and all the details from everybody with polycystic kidney disease and everybody in the family without it. And he found a few interesting things. Um, we had people who were dialyzing in the unit next to each other, had been for years, and didn't know they were related. <laughs> so he went back and chased the old Auntie Ethel who was living in, you know, somewhere, and she said, oh yeah, we've got that side of the family, we've got that side of the family. So he put these huge families together where you got 18 with the disease and 46 without the disease. And then you've got another family where you've got 17 with the disease and 27 without the disease. So he was able to bring together some really quite large families. And then he had to start looking for the gene. Um, and that was a little bit testing for him because the way he did it in those days, it's very easy now, you just put it in the machine, out comes the result eight hours later. Um, it cost $2 billion to, uh, to sequence um, 
uh, the first human genome. It costs us about 2,000 bucks now. Um, so the, the maths, the science, and the technologies have advanced. But in those days, you had to go looking, and you had to have a candidate gene, and then you had to chop up the genes and see if this candidate was always in the same place as the polycystic kidney disease. And um, he got pretty much to the end of his thesis, hadn't found it. And then he was looking, literally, he was looking through the fridge at all these little markers. And they said, what about this one? And the, the hematologist said, oh, well, that's a particular hemoglobin gene. He said, oh, better try that one. Well, that hemoglobin gene is just right there on this chromosome. And it's segmented exactly. And he could pinpoint where the polycystic kidney disease gene was for PKD1. So that was the first time it was discovered. So that was about 30, just a bit over 30 years ago, 34 years ago, 33 years ago. Um, and it didn't find a gene, but it found where it was, so that we could then go on to get the gene. And here's the gene. And it's a monster. It's a huge gene. And this is part of what gives polycystic kidney disease a bit of variability. Because you need an error in that gene to produce polycystic kidney disease. And Jackie will talk a little bit more about how that actually links up to cause disease. But that gene produces a protein. And if you've got errors in that protein, it doesn't work properly. But it can be anywhere along here. And there are probably, well, there's at least 100 different mistakes in that gene that we've found in patients with polycystic kidney disease. When I say we, globally, we've found. Which makes a few things quite tricky. So, for example, you ought to be able to do... Um, you know, gene markers in utero. But it ain't that easy, because you've got to get the right gene marker for that family. So you've got to be able to know which is the abnormal gene for that family. So here's this gene, multiple different answers, and there's the PKD2 gene in a different place, chromosome 4. This one's on chromosome 16. Um, this is a gene which was found in the Italian families to begin with, and Malta. And we've got quite a few people from Malta here in Australia who probably got this gene rather than that gene abnormality. And again, lots of different versions. This is a slightly smaller molecule. And what they produce is these proteins. So you can imagine that if you've got a, um, a very small um, error in the middle of one of these bits here, it's not going to make any difference to how the gene functions. The molecule is going to work just the same. But if you've got a critical abnormality in here or here or here or here, which is a bit of the protein that does some work, then that's what causes us the abnormalities. So we get um, changes in those genes that matter and changes in those genes that don't matter, which makes genetics complicated. Um, Clinically, it's a lot easier for us. So here we've got, uh, this is something uh, Gopi Rangan put together, um, looking at, have I got the disease? It's an important question. And an ultrasound. Now that can give you, um, can identify cysts. And if you've got, between the ages of 15 and 29, more than three, on one side or both sides, then it's going to mean that you've got polycystic kidney disease, if you've got a family history. If you haven't got more than three, it's only right 82% of the time that you haven't got it. Does that make sense? So if you can see the cysts, you've got it. If you can't see the cysts at that age, you probably haven't got it. The sensitivity rises as you get older. So that by the time you're 60, if you haven't got the cyst, you haven't got the disease. But it's not a perfect, not a perfect test. These molecules, call these proteins, cause trouble in other places. And we don't understand them all, but there are some other abnormalities. This is one of them. This is a liver. Here are the kidneys. A few cysts in the kidneys. But look at the liver. Lots of big cysts in the liver. So some people have more trouble with polycystic liver disease than polycystic kidney disease. Uh, and then there's a, a variant which occurs in some families where you get little aneurysms in the brain. 
and uh, they can cause trouble. So we have to look out for people who might have aneurysms. It, it goes in the family. So if you've got a family without them, then you haven't got them. If you've got a family with them, we've got to look for it. So the real question is, what can we actually do about this? And some of what we've been doing for the last 30 years is reminiscent of what we were doing for tuberculosis in the 1890s. We haven't really got a clue. But some things made a bit of difference. And to a certain extent, some of these things make a bit of difference, and some things make quite a lot of difference. Don't smoke. Please don't smoke. It's seriously bad for you. Um, and if you smoke and you've got polycystic kidney disease, it's going to make it worse. But it's not going to make the polycystic kidney disease worse. It's going to make treating the problems worse. Um, salt. Um, can cause higher blood pressure, and particularly if you've got some kidney disease and you don't handle salt very well, you get high blood pressure. And high blood pressure does cause trouble. Um, if you drink too much, you get pissed, but also it's not good for the kidneys. Um, and if you get overweight, it really gets a little bit hard to treat you. Now, polycystic kidney disease is one of these really unfair diseases. You look fat or you look pregnant and you're neither, especially if you're a man. But um, it, it is a problem because you, you've got these big kidneys and you're not fat. Um, so talking about nutrition later uh, will be important to Michelle will cover that. From a medical point of view, blood pressure. Making sure blood pressure is right. And one of the things that I always tell people is, you know, even if you don't know you've got the disease, if you've got it in the family, just keep your blood pressure measured so you know you don't get it to sneak up on you because high blood pressure can just sneak up on you and that does cause trouble. Similarly, cholesterol, sugar and then drugs that can cause um, damage to the kidneys. So there are some th simple things that we can all do um, to keep the kidneys okay. This is the problem. You get, whoop, you get a cyst and it grows and this is the tubule that's supposed to be doing the work and it squashes it. Literally, it squashes it, pushes it out of the way. And so there's no room for the normal functioning kidney, and that's the problem. So size means everything. <coughs> so this is a drug which we thought on the basis of some science, this is Gopi Rangan working in this uh, and others, maybe we can reduce the size of these kidneys by giving this drug. It's a drug we use for transplantation. Um, incidentally, so it's seemed expressive. And this is some rat kidneys who get polycystic kidney disease, and this is giving everything in the preparation except the drug, and this is giving the drug. And so the drug has kept the kidney quite a lot smaller compared with control. If you start treatment late after the cysts have grown a lot, it's pretty hard to make it happen. So this says if we gave Sirolimus to kids young and kept them on it, for 50 years, it would probably help. But it's got side effects, and we wouldn't want to be able to give this drug in humans from an early age for 50 years. It's not safe to do that. So, we got something that makes a difference. Very positive piece of message, and that's news which we've been waiting for for probably 25 years. We know that there's a hormone called vasopressin, which is meant to retain water. You remember I said 20 litres goes out, we get 18 of it back, 2 goes out into the toilet? Well, we've got hormones that adjust that for us. So if you've been out for a big night, and you've had 3 or 4 pints of beer, it doesn't have to keep so much back, it needs to let a bit more out. And if you're in the desert and you haven't drunk anything for a week, it needs to hold back as much as possible. So we've got these hormones that adjust this. Uh, and they do it via this thing called vasopressin. Vasopressin also is a growth factor for these cysts. And I just told you, don't get these cysts. They're bad for you. So maybe if we could block vasopressin, that would work. So here are some rat experiments. Um, let's block the, um, the vasopressin. Now, when we've got a rat, we can do it properly. We can actually block the, we can get rid of this receptor. We can delete it from the rat. 
So here's a rat with the receptor and polycystic kidney disease. Delete the receptor so the rat just can't respond to vasopressin, doesn't have it, and look what's happened. And then you can prove the point by adding vasopressin, that's vasopressin, back and demonstrating that you get the cysts back in the animals that don't get polycystic kidney disease because they haven't got the vasopressin um, receptor. And so we get to uh, this, which is to use a, the first drug that's actually shown to do some good, tolvaptan. This is an antagonist to the vasopressin receptor. It blocks it. And these are people who've been followed here for three years with it or with a placebo. And you can see here on this side the kidney volume. Um, I think it was measured by MRI. And here, the kidney function. The kidney function hasn't gone down as much, and the kidney vol volume hasn't gone up as much by taking the drug. Not cheap. Under discussion at the moment with government. And it's a problem for all pharmaceutical industry to raise money for drugs. You need two billion quid. That's probably going to be worth about two billion dollars, fairly soon. But, um, <laughs> But two billion pounds to take a drug to market, and you've got to get that back. Otherwise, it's a business which is kind of losing. Um, and that's why some of these drugs are really seriously expensive. Maybe we can try something else as well. So this is our rats with polycystic kidney disease, which Gopi has a has a whole set set of them, uh, as do others, and you'll hear more about it. But if you give rats the normal amount of water, they produce the normal amount of vasopressin. But if you give them a whole heap of water, they don't need to produce the vasopressin because the rat just needs to let the water out. And guess what? Their kidneys don't grow. Water. Let's try water. So, um, does drinking enough water to keep hydrated slow the cysts growth? And, and Gopi has got together this trial which will try and demonstrate it, to see whether if you take a lot of water, you can slow the rate of progression of your polycystic kidneys. That's a very brief tour through where we are at the moment. We've gone from, we can see it happening in families, to we know exactly what the genes are, and we know the variations that occur. We know the proteins that are affected, and you're going to hear a little bit more, more about what those proteins do in a moment. And we're now, fortunately, into this exciting era over the next five to ten years where we're going to have things we can do that will slow it down. And that's really important because it's like the first chemotherapy for tuberculosis. It's about fixing HIV with the drugs we've got. Now we've got hepatitis C. We can treat and, and eradicate hepatitis C. Soon we'll be able to do the same thing with polycystic kidney disease. Um, it's tough business but we will get that. And that's why the PKD association is really important. I just want to highlight Gopi, who's actually on a plane at the moment going to either Europe or America, I wasn't quite sure where, um, to a meeting to discuss just this issue. Uh, and he sends his apologies, but he gave me the whole stack of his slides uh, and the um, funding that we've got and the uh, research activity that we've had to help us get through this. So. Thank you. I'll now hand over back to you. Thank you, Professor um, <clears throat> Our next speaker is, is um, Jacqueline, Professor Jacqueline Phillips, <clears throat> who's a neurophysiologist just upstairs in the Department of Biomedical Sciences and, and the new Faculty of Medicine at, here at Macquarie Uni. Um, she initially trained as a veterinarian, which I find ridiculously interesting. Um, <laughs> Um, and she came to Macquarie Uni in, after working at, at Murdoch University in Perth. But I think I'll leave it up to you, Jeff, to tell us all the relevant things. Thank you. Okay, so while we're getting started, I just wanted to thank you all for coming tonight. I think this is a fantastic um, event to be occurring in Australia with regards to PKD, PKD research, and raising the profile of PKD in the community. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an honour to be here and, and talking to you tonight. So, um, as Jeremy mentioned, I'm going to sort of follow a little bit more about um, PKD and delve a little bit more into the detail um, from a specific aspect of the basic science. 
and present to you some of the new and exciting things that are happening that are a bit more um, out there, um, not necessarily at the point of being ready and, and functional for potential clinical trial studies, but we'll touch that a bit more. But just some of the, the new research that's happening and give you a bit of a flavour for what's going on there. So, as you now know, PKD is due to a genetic mutation in a protein. What you don't know is that that proteins, or you may know, um, I, I apologise, you may know that those proteins are actually expressed in what we call cilia. So cilia are little functional um, appendages expressed on the surface of many, many cells of the body, and in particular on the cell of the kidney, of the epithelial cell that lines the nephron that Jeremy showed you the picture of. PKD is actually part of a, a greater sort of group of diseases that are called ciliopathies that arise because of a mutation in a gene that is expressed or associated with the function of this particular organism or organ, part of the organ, which is called a cilia. So what are cilia? Okay, so what we've got here is actually a picture of a renal tubule, which is part of the kidney that filters the, the blood and produces the urine. And this is a normal kidney here from a normal rat, actually. This is from um, one of my students' work. And you can see these little things just sticking up off the surface of the cell. They're the cilia. That's a normal kidney from a normal rat and a normal cilia. This is the cilia from the same rats that Jeremy was talking about that have polycystic kidney disease that we've been studying. And you can see immediately just the, the structure of the nephron looks different. The cell structure is different. That's because this is part of a cyst. But you can see here these cilia. See how they're really long? They're curly. Um, sometimes we get them splitting into two branches. Sometimes we have two cilia coming from an individual cell. So something's gone wrong. So in association with these cysts, we get these abnormal cilia present on the cell. Okay. So this is just showing a cell culture where we've taken cells that are kidney cells, derived kidney cells, and they've been grown on a plate. And you can see here that they've been labelled for cilia here, and you can see these little cilia coming off the edge of the cell. So that's sort of a normal cilia. And this is a similar thing showing again from a kidney of a normal animal, that little cilia sticking out from the surface of the cell. So these cilia are called primary cilium, and they're cilia where you, so you've got one single functional cilia, and it actually functions to sense the external environment. So in the kidney, it'll actually sense urine flow. So it will move with the flow of the urine, and that actually signals internally to the cell other things to happen, but we'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. The other type of cilia you can get um, are what are called motile cilia. So I don't know if you're aware of in the lungs or in your, um, your bronchi, you've got little cilia, there are lots and lots of them that function to move things along, and they're called motile cilia, and they're slightly different in structure to the primary cilia that's affected in conditions like PKD. So if we were to look at the cilia under electron microscope, you can see that's it there. And if we were to cut it across the top there, you can see that inside they've got quite a unique little structure with these little ringlets or microtubules that form part of the, the central structure of the cilia. And in the mo primary cilia, we've got nine of these little doublets around the outside, whereas in the motile cilia, we've got nine of, this, nine of these little cilia microtubules, and then we've got um, single microtubules in the middle. And they're connected to the structure of the cilia by little arms that help control the cilia function, particularly in these guys that actually have to actively move. So this is the cilium there, and what happens is if you look at these structures here, they actually form part of this structure which is um, a functional component of the cilia that works to actually transport proteins into the cilia where they do their job, and then out of the cilia when they're finished with. Okay? And so this is actually called intraflagellate transport. So cilia actually means eyelash, I discovered today. It's Latin for eyelash. Okay? And they were first discovered to a very large degree. A lot of work was done in, in um, organisms that were single cellular organisms, and they're flagella in those. So that's where the IFT comes from, intraflagella transport. So this little sort of transport system here transports proteins up and down and around and allows the cilia to do its job. The cilia, as we're discovering now with more and more research, does a lot more than we thought it did. People thought it just sat there and did nothing. But as particularly now with all the research around PKD, we're discovering that these proteins have a really important role in the function of the cell on an everyday basis. You'll see here these two proteins, PC1 and 2. These are the PKD proteins that Jeremy talked about before, polycystin 1 and polycystin 2. So they actually get carried up into the cilia where they function on the cell surface of the cilia, carry out their job, and then are transported back down. What happens is if you get any protein associated with this function disrupted, you can end up with a ciliopathy, and most commonly, PKD, or you might get some of these other syndromes where you get not only cysts in the kidney, but cysts in the other tissues of the body as well. And that can be dependent on the protein that's actually disrupted. 
So there's actually lots of proteins that could potentially cause a cystic kidney disease-like syndrome. So why do changes in proteins found in cilia cause PKD? So this is quite a, a similar image to the one that Jeremy showed you before, showing that here's our normal renal epithelial cell. Here's the cilia. And in this cell, there's normally normal function for the cell will divide as the cells are damaged, replaced, and you get a normal cell turnover process. What happens is that when you get a mutation, the capacity of these cells to divide at a normal rate or to divide in a normal pattern is lost. And what happens is that instead of getting the normal cilia being involved in the cell division and the normal structure of the nephron, these cilia dysfunction means that that normal patterning and that normal rate of growth is perturbed and you end up getting this cyst formation that Jeremy described before. And in autosomal dominant PKD, you get these cysts forming off the side of the nephron. Okay, so it's also associated with the loss of the capacity of the cell to divide normally and also to divide in the right pattern. So you get this um, uncontrolled cell division and cyst formation. So why are cilia important? Okay, so cilia are actually a very important part of the cell cycle process where cells divide. So this is just a beautiful image from a paper from Human Molecular Genetics. And here is a cell, okay, and this is the different phases of the cell. You don't need to worry about those per se, but I'll put them up there for, for scientific accuracy. You can see here this little green thing here labelled with, um, actually called alpha tubulin, which is the cilia sitting on the cell just in its resting state. The blue is the nucleus of the cell and the red is actin, which is part of, sort of the microfilament that forms the cell. When a cell normally divides, what happens is the cilia that's sitting there on the outside actually disassembles and goes back into the cell and becomes part of what we call the mitotic spindle. So you can see here what's forming is the mitotic spindle and as the cell divides we get this spindle-like effect with the cell and all the genetic material being carried between the two cells and the cilia components are broken down to make a part of that. What then happens is that the cell then goes back into a non-dividing phase. The cilia components start getting reconstructed and bang, we have our cilia formed again back to the resting state. So that's what it does normally. And for some reason, when the cilia aren't able to participate in this function properly, we get this abnormal cell division. So a lot of the research at the basic science level into PKD is actually looking at these proteins and these protein complexes because they interact with each other that form and make up the cilia, okay? So a lot of new proteins and new protein complexes are being discovered that can cause abnormal cilia or prevent normal cilia function and therefore PKD type conditions and ciliopathies when they're mutated. And identifying these basic structural components at the cellular level really allows us to understand what the normal function and makeup of the cell is and therefore, when it goes wrong, why? What's gone wrong? So it gives us a clue um, as to the proteins and their function and therefore it may give us a clue as to what other mutations might cause PKD, okay, so as well as the PKD1 and the PKD2 that you've been told about and also the gene responsible for PK, um, PKHD1 which is responsible for autosomal recessive PKD. There are other proteins, so another type of cystic kidney disease for example is nephronephiasis and there's a family of proteins that are involved um, that are called nephrocystins and they cause PKD as well, but a different type of cause cystic kidney disease. The advantage of knowing what these proteins are is, as I said, we understand the normal function, but also they might be able to reveal new potential target treatments for polycystic kidney disease. So just I want to give you a couple of snapshots now of some recent research. Um, this is a paper that only came out just recently in a very high profile journal called Nature Genetics, where what they were doing was looking at proteins involved in the cilia and they actually identified a new cluster of proteins, which they've called C-plane. And these proteins in normal cilia come together and they function to assist in this process of transporting proteins up through the intraflagellar transport system and out again. If you mutate one of the proteins involved in this cluster of three particular proteins, what happens is that this transport process is perturbed. And in this particular case, these C-plane proteins result in quite a severe form of, of cystic kidney disease and other target organs are affected as well. But what it's done is it told us that this is an important protein involved in cilia function and it's also now been identified that some of these proteins are actually mutated in certain individuals with syndromes that the gene hadn't been identified in before. So through the basic science we've been able to give these families some identification of what the protein and what the issue is with their particular genetic syndromes. Some of the other research that's done in regards to understanding PKD is research into novel treatments. So um, looking at new and different ways to limit cyst growth in polycystic kidney disease. 
So some of the things that have been done recently, um, and this is again using animal models, so a lot of the work starts in the animal models. In this particular study, what the researchers did was that they looked at the kidney and they noticed that the kidney structure, the blood vessels were abnormal. So the, the blood vessels that were in the polycystic kidneys were not developed properly and it, it looked as though that was part of the, the growth issue was associated with the poor blood supply to the kidneys. So what they did was they actually used a drug um, called VEGFC, which affects and promotes blood vessel growth. And they treated rats that had, um, so mice, that had polycystic kidney disease or did not have polycystic kidney disease and they looked to see what happened to the kidneys of these animals. And you can see here, this is a normal animal, the control. This is a cystic kidney animal. And this is an animal that's been treated with the drug to promote blood vessel growth. And they found a significant reduction in the size of those kidneys, which, as Jeremy was saying, is really important to keep the kidneys small because it allows those normal nephrons to not be squashed and to function normally. Okay? And they showed a significant improvement in the renal function of these animals. So that's, you know, that's a promising new treatment. Um, all these things are a long way away from developing into clinical... Um, effective treatments, but we're looking at all these trying to get new clues, new novel ideas. Okay, another example here is an example where researchers were looking at novel drug delivery systems. So one of the issues with polycystic kidney disease is if you want to actually treat the kidney, you have kidneys with cysts that have fluid in them, and getting drugs delivered into that cystic area is quite difficult. It's a difficult way of, it's very difficult to get treatments at a high enough concentration into the kidney area where you want the drug to act. And what this particular group did was that they noticed that in cystic kidneys that they've been looking at from humans, an increased expression of this receptor called PLGR. I won't go through its full name. And they thought, you know, why, what's different? Why is this increased? What's going on? And then they made a link with another group who said, oh, well, that particular receptor carries um, antibodies. And they, what they found was that if they looked at cystic kidneys, this is again from an animal model, this is just showing the cysts of the cells of the kidney. And this is showing that this receptor here is increasing in expression in the lining of those cysts. Whereas in normal kidney, you didn't see that increase in expression. And you can see here the double label. We've got the red showing the tubules of the kidney and the green showing this receptor. And what they then showed was that by using this receptor, they could actually increase the delivery of specific antibodies into the kidney itself. And antibodies are being used as therapeutics. So this is possibly a way of getting an increased concentration of antibodies against specific proteins that might limit the growth of those kidneys and those cysts. So again, another, another way of looking at it, how can we improve drug delivery to improve the effectiveness of drugs that treat PKD? Okay. Another angle that we can take this type of research is looking at how can we better understand the current treatments. Um, and how can we work to improve the way the current treatments influence the burden of disease for people suffering from polycystic kidney disease. One of the issues that was mentioned was blood pressure, okay, and high blood pressure is an important component of um, the symptoms associated with polycystic kidney disease. This is an area that our research is looking at in some detail, and this is just an example of how um, antihypertensive drugs can help reduce the burden of disease. So again, this is our animal model of polycystic kidney disease. And these are rats that have been treated with a drug called perindopril, which inhibits a hormone system called the renin angiotensin system. And you can see here, these are the systolic blood pressure, so that's sort of the peak blood pressure of the cycle of blood pressure as it goes up and down with each heartbeat in our diseased animals. And you can see that it's quite high. It sits up at about 200 millimetres of mercury. When we treat those animals with uh, perindopril, that blood pressure comes down significantly. These animals have been treated from six weeks of age to 11 weeks of age. So it's made a significant impact on their blood pressure. And we know that that therefore reduces the risk of heart disease, which is a common risk for people with chronic kidney disease and polycystic kidney disease. And it also re reduces um, the risk of that blood pressure having secondary damaging effects on the kidney. Because blood pressure and kidney disease is a catch-22 cycle. High blood pressure can cause kidney disease. Kidney disease causes high blood pressure. So if we can break that cycle, that's really important. One of the other things we've done with these animals, we've looked at the blood vessels of these animals because we know that um, a, a common association of um, kidney disease is stiff blood vessels. And one of the reasons blood vessels get stiff is because they get calcium in them. Literally the same thing that's in your bones can deposit in your, in your blood vessels and cause them to become stiff, which is another factor that will put up your blood pressure. So this is another study where we've treated animals again with a drug that blocks the renin angiotensin system and we can show that in fact this is, these are our normal animals, our controls, and these are our PKD animals. And you can see this black stain is for calcium and you can see that calcium deposition in the aorta of these animals. The other thing you might notice is that the width of these vessels is much wider 
in the diseased animals. When we treat these animals with a drug that blocks the renin-angiotensin system, in the normals it doesn't have much effect, but in our diseased animals, one, it's reduced the width of that blood vessel, which helps its function, and two, it's reduced that calcium deposition dramatically. There's still some, but it really dropped that down a lot. And this is one of the first studies to show that this might be one of the mechanisms of action that makes these drugs that block the renin-angiotensin system so effective in controlling blood pressure. So we're better understanding the drugs that we use and therefore have a better rationale for using them. Okay, one of the other areas that we're looking at is exercise. So exercise was mentioned as being a very important component of keeping healthy. Exercise has also been shown to improve what's called your baroreceptor reflex. So if I was to get you all to stand up now, so everybody stand up for me. Okay, what's happened to all of you is that you've had to affect gravity. You can sit down now. <laughs> Okay, so when you stand up, what happens is that your blood pressure changes because your head is now elevated, you've got an effect of gravity, and you have to change your heart rate to control and affect that blood pressure so you don't faint when you stand up. Okay, and that's all controlled by what we call the baroreceptor reflex. The baroreceptor reflex is improved dramatically with exercise, and we know that the baroreceptor reflex is impaired in polycystic kidney disease. So one of our studies that's underway is looking at how exercise in animals with polycystic kidney disease could improve that baroreceptor reflex. So this is the moment where we go, let's hope the movie works. Okay, so what we've done is train our animals to run on a treadmill. They do this voluntarily. Um, the, number <laughs> <laughs> the number of kilometres they clock up a week is phenomenal. Um, and then we're looking at their blood pressure, we're looking at their kidney function, and we're looking importantly at their baroreceptor reflex to see it's improved by that exercise. So that's another angle of looking to see how can we reduce the burden of disease through lifestyle factors with polycystic kidney disease. Okay, now the last thing Sarah wanted me to briefly touch on was clinical trials. And you've already heard about one potential study with the, with the water. Um, I just wanted to take you through to two other examples of clinical trials that are currently underway. So clinical trials are really uh, large-scale studies that test the effectiveness of new or modified current treatments, usually against a control group or a placebo group in terms of the, the population of the study. Um, one study that's just been completed is called the HALT PKD study. You may have heard of this. And this is where what they did is they wanted to compare the effect of a single drug that's used to reduce blood pressure that blocks the renin-angiotensin system that I talked to you about compared with using two drugs to block the renin-angiotensin system. With the theory that by using the two drugs, you block two separate actions of that pathway and therefore will be more effective. In, in this particular study, they were looking at um, incidence of end-stage renal disease and also looking at other measures such as blood pressure. So in these types of studies, um, they start off with thousands of patients. So here they started out with 1,300 patients that were screened for eligibility. Some were excluded for various reasons and then they were taken through and when underwent other exclusion processes until they had a, a consistent group of people so that you were controlling for various factors. Then what they do is they randomised you to two different groups. So one group were assigned to receive what's called lisinopril, which is a drug that um, blocks the... Uh, it's called an ACE inhibitor that blocks RAS production. And, and combine that with telemisartan, which blocks the receptor for that particular hormone. The other group were assigned to receive the lisinopril only and a placebo. So they didn't know, they were getting um, either the second drug or a placebo. They didn't know which one, which, which arm they were in. They then followed these patients through, and typically with these studies you lose patients along the way for various reasons. At the end of the study they had 243 in the combined group and 242 in the group with the placebo. And then they'll go through and they'll do the detailed analysis of all the variables that they're measuring during the course of these studies. So I just wanted to show you this picture, not dissimilar to what I showed you with our rats, one of the things they looked at was blood pressure. And this is systolic blood pressure in the patients, and in both groups, both with the single drug or with both drugs, you get a drop in both the systolic and the diastolic blood pressure. And what they found is, in this particular study, that you got a slight improvement in blood pressure that was greater with the two drugs combined. It wasn't marked, but it was a slight improvement in that decrease in blood pressure. Unfortunately, though, well, for this particular study, what they found was that all the other measures were not different, okay, including kidney function. So certainly this study showed quite convincingly that the addition of a second drug did not produce any additional clinical benefit for patients with PKD, um, and therefore the one drug is sufficient to get the benefit from that blood pressure reduction. Okay. So one other study that's currently just underway, and this is a pilot study, um, 
that I found out about. Um, you can, if you go to one of the NIH websites, they have a list of all the current clinical trials, and you can type in PKD, and it gives you a list of all the clinical trials that are currently underway for PKD at the moment. This particular start, study is a pilot study, so it's the first of a, a number of studies. If this one goes well, they'll go on to a bigger one. In this particular one, it's a randomised control trial. So again, people are randomised into two groups, and there's a control. So there'll be a placebo or a no-treatment group. In this particular study, what they're looking at is the effect of the dietary supplement niacinamide, or vitamin B3, versus placebo. And again, they're looking at measures, um, in this particular case, they're looking at kidney injury, cyst growth, and kidney function as some of the outcomes. This study was actually based on a study that originated in animals. So what they found was in the initial study in mice, which was published in 2013, that if you inhibit a protein called CERT1 with vitamin B3, you actually get reduction in cyst growth and improved kidney function. So these are the normal animals, these are the diseased animals, and then these are the animals that have been treated with varying amounts of the vitamin B3. And so you can see that the kidneys have reduced in size. And when they actually measure the cyst area, these are our treated animals here, significant reduction. If you look at the actual body weight to kidney weight ratio, again, significantly reduced in the treated animals. And if you look at the blood urea nitrogen, which is a measure of kidney function, significantly reduced in these animals. So based on these preclinical studies and the basic science, so they identified the protein, then they did the preclinical study in the animal, now they're doing the pilot study in humans, and if that shows promising results, that will then be phased up into a larger clinical trial. So I think there's actually quite a nice example of the full circle, where we can go from basic science to a clinical trial, and may very well go back again and start that cycle. So research really encompasses all those aspects. And um, I'd like to, again, thank you very much for being here and um, the funding for my research. The work I presented today was funded by National Health and Medical Research Council and Hillcrest Foundation. I didn't have time to present to you some of the work that we're now studying that's been generously funded by the Polycystic Kidney Disease Foundation of Australia. So thank you.